Prologue and Dramatis Personae of She Stoops to Conquer. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. She Stoops to Conquer, or The Mistakes of a Knight, a Comedy, by Oliver Goldsmith. To Samuel Johnson, LLD. Dear Sir, by inscribing this slight performance to you, I do not mean so much to compliment you as myself. It may do me some honor to inform the public that I have lived many years in intimacy with you. It may serve the interests of mankind also to inform them that the greatest wit may be found in a character, without impairing the most unaffected piety. I have, particularly, reason to thank you for your partiality to this performance. The undertaking a comedy, not merely sentimental, was very dangerous, and Mr. Coleman, who saw this piece in its various stages, always thought it so. However, I ventured to trust it to the public, and, though it was necessarily delayed till late in the season, I have every reason to be grateful. I am, dear sir, your most sincere friend and admirer, Oliver Goldsmith. Prologue by David Garrick, Esquire Enter Mr. Woodward, dressed in black, and holding a handkerchief to his eyes. Excuse me, sirs, I pray, I can't yet speak. I'm crying now, and have been all the week. Tis not alone this morning's suit, good masters. I've that within, for which there are no plasters. Pray, would you know the reason why I'm crying? The comic muse, long sick, is now a-dying. And if she goes, my tears will never stop. For as a player I cannot squeeze out one drop. I am undone, that's all, shall lose my bread. I'd rather, but that's nothing, lose my head. When the sweet maid is laid upon the bier, Shooter and I shall be chief mourners here. To her a mawkish drab of spurious breed, Who deals in sentimentals, will succeed. Poor Ned and I are dread to all intents, We can as soon speak Greek as sentiments. Both nervous grown to keep our spirits up, We now and then take down our hearty cup. What shall we do, if comedy forsake us? They'll turn us out, and no one else will take us. But why can't I be moral? Let me try. My heart thus pressing, fixed my face and eye, With a sententious look, that's nothing means. Faces are blocks in sentimental scenes. Thus I begin, all is not gold that glitters, Pleasure seems sweet, but proves a glass of bitters. When ignorance enters, folly is at hand. Learning is better far than house and land. Let not your virtue trip, who trips may stumble, and virtue is not virtue if she tumble. I give it up. Morals won't do for me. To make you laugh I must play tragedy. One hope remains, hearing the maid was ill. A doctor comes this night to show his skill to cheer her heart and give your muscles motion he in five draughts prepared presents a potion a kind of magic charm for be assured if you will swallow it the maid is cured but desperate the doctor and her case is if you reject the dose and make wry faces this truth he boasts will boast it while he lives no poisonous drugs are mixed in what he gives should he succeed you'll give him his degree if not, within he will receive no fee. The college, you, must his pretensions back. Pronounce him regular, or dub him quack. Dramatis Personae Hardcastle, read by Bob Neufeld Sir Charles Marlowe, read by David Lawrence Marlowe, read by Lambda Hastings, read by Brett Downey Tony Lumpkin, read by Todd. Mrs. Hardcastle, read by Avaii. Miss Hardcastle, read by Arielle Lipshaw. Miss Neville, read by Charlotte Duckett. First Fellow, First Servant, read by Draconis. Second Fellow, Second Servant, and Jeremy, read by Tex Avi. Third Fellow, Third Servant, Roger, read by Joseph Abel. Fourth Fellow and Diggory, read by Algie Pug. The Landlord, read by David Williams. The Maid, read by Amanda Friday. Servant, read by Elizabeth Clatt. 
The role of Mr. Woodward, read by David Williams. Stage directions read by Laurie Ann Walden. End of Prologue and Dramatis Personae. Act One of She Stoops to Conquer. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. She Stoops to Conquer by Oliver Goldsmith. Act the First. Scene A Chamber in an Old Fashioned House. Enter Mrs. Hardcastle and Mr. Hardcastle. I vow, Mr. Hardcastle, you're very particular. Is there a creature in the whole country but ourselves that does not take a trip to town now and then to rub off the rust a little? There's the two Miss Hogs, and our neighbour Mrs. Grigsby go to take a month's polishing every winter. Ay, and bring back vanity and affectation to last them the whole year. I wonder why London cannot keep its own fools at home. In my time, the follies of the town crept slowly among us, but now they travel faster than a stagecoach. Its fopperies come down not only as inside passengers, but in the very basket. Ay, your times were fine times indeed. You have been telling us of them for many a long year. Here we live in an old rumbling mansion that looks for all the world like an inn, but that we never see company. Our best visitors are old Mrs. Oddfish, the curate's wife, and little Cripplegate, the lame dancing master, and all our entertainment your old stories of Prince Eugene and the Duke of Marlborough. I hate such old-fashioned trumpery. And I love it. I love everything that's old. Old friends, old times, old manners, old books, old wine. And I believe, Dorothy taking her hand. You'll own that I have been pretty fond of an old wife. Lord, Mr. Hartcastle, you're forever at your Dorothy's and your old wives. You may be a Darby, but I'll be no Joan, I promise you. I'm not so old as you'd make me, by more than one good year. Add twenty to twenty and make money of that. Let me see. Twenty added to twenty makes just fifty and seven. It's false, Mr. Hardcastle. I was but twenty when I was brought to bed of Tony that I had by Mr. Lumpkin, my first husband, and he's not come to years of discretion yet. Nor ever will, I dare answer for him. Ay, you have taught him finely. No matter. Tony Lumpkin has a good fortune. My son is not to live by his learning. I don't think a boy wants much learning to spend fifteen hundred a year. Learning, quotha, a mere composition of tricks and mischief. Humour, my dear, nothing but humour. Come, Mr. Hardcastle, you must allow the boy a little humour. I'd sooner allow him a horse-pond. If burning the footman's shoes, frightening the maids, and worrying the kittens be humour, he has it. It was but yesterday he fastened my wig to the back of my chair. And when I went to make a bow, I popped my bald head in Mrs. Frizzle's face. And am I to blame? The poor boy was always too sickly to do any good. A school would be his death. When he comes to be a little stronger, who knows what a year or two's Latin may do for him? Latin for him. A cat and fiddle. No, no, the alehouse and the stable are the only schools he'll ever go to. Well, we must not snub the poor boy now, for I believe we shan't have him long among us. Anybody that looks in his face may see he's consumptive. Ay, if growing too fat be one of the symptoms. He coughs sometimes. Yes, when his liquor goes the wrong way. I'm actually afraid of his lungs. And truly, so am I, for he sometimes whoops like a speaking trumpet. Tony hallooing behind the scenes. Whoa, ho, ho, ho! Hallo! Hallo! Oh, there he goes, a very consumptive figure, truly. Enter Tony, crossing the stage. Tony, where are you going, my charmer? Won't you give Papa and I a little of your company, lovey? 
I'm in haste, mother. I cannot stay. You shan't venture out this raw evening, my dear. You look most shockingly. I can't stay, I tell you. The three pigeons expects me down every moment. There's some fun going forward. Aye, the alehouse, the old place. I thought so. A low, paltry set of fellows. Not so low, neither. There's Dick Muggins, the excise man, Jack Slang, the horse doctor, little Amanabad that grinds the music box, and Tom Twist that spins the pewter platter. Pray, my dear, disappoint them for one night at least. As for disappointing them, I should not so much mind. But I can't abide to disappoint myself. Detaining him. You shan't go. I will, I tell you. I say you shan't. We'll see which is strongest, you or I. Exit, hauling her out. Solus. Aye, there goes a pair that only spoil each other. But it's not the whole age in a combination to drive sense and discretion out of doors. There's my pretty darling Kate. The fashions of the times have almost infected her, too. By living a year or two in town, she is as fond of gauze and French frippery as the best of them. Enter Miss Hardcastle. Blessings on my pretty innocence. Dressed out as usual, my Kate. Goodness, what a quantity of superfluous silk hast thou got about thee, girl? I can never teach the fools of this age that the indigent world can be clothed out of the trimmings of the vein. You know our agreement, sir. You allow me the morning to receive and pay visits, and to dress in my own manner, and in the evening I put on my housewife's dress to please you. Well, remember, I insist on the terms of our agreement, and by the by, I believe I shall have occasion to try your obedience this very evening. I protest, sir. I don't comprehend your meaning. Then, to be plain with you, Kate, I expect the young gentleman I have chosen for your husband from town this very day. I have his father's letter, in which he informs me his son is set out, and that he intends to follow himself shortly after. Indeed. I wish I had known something of this before. Bless me, how shall I behave? It's a thousand to one I shan't like him. Our meeting will be so formal, and so like a thing of business, that I shall find no room for friendship or esteem. Depend upon it, child, I'll never control your choice. But Mr. Marlowe, whom I have pitched upon, is the son of my old friend, Sir Charles Marlowe, of whom you have heard me talk so often. The young gentleman has been bred a scholar, and is designed for an employment in the service of his country. I am told he's a man of excellent understanding. Is he? Very generous. I believe I shall like him. Young and brave. I'm sure I shall like him. And very handsome. My dear papa, say no more. Kissing his hand. He's mine. I'll have him. And to crown all, Kate, he's one of the most bashful and reserved young fellows in all the world. Eh? You have frozen me to death again. That word reserved has undone all the rest of his accomplishments. A reserved lover, it is said, always makes a suspicious husband. On the contrary, modesty seldom resides in a breast that is not enriched with nobler virtues. It was the very feature in his character that first struck me. He must have more striking features to catch me, I promise you. However, if he be so young, so handsome, and so everything as you mention, I believe he'll do still. I think I'll have him. Aye, Kate, but there is still an obstacle. It's more than an even wager he may not have you. My dear papa, why will you mortify one so? Well, if he refuses, instead of breaking my heart at his indifference, I'll only break my glass for its flattery, set my cap to some newer fashion, and look out for some less difficult admirer. Bravely resolved. In the meantime, I'll go prepare the servants for his reception. As we seldom see company, they want as much training as a company of recruits the first day's muster. Exit. Alone. Lud, this news of papa's puts me all in a flutter. Young, handsome, these he put last. 
but I put them foremost. Sensible, good-natured, I like all that. But then reserved and sheepish, that's much against him. Yet can't he be cured of his timidity by being taught to be proud of his wife? Yes, and can't I? But I vow I'm disposing of the husband before I have secured the lover. Enter Miss Neville. I'm glad you're come, Neville, my dear. Tell me, Constance, how do I look this evening? Is there anything whimsical about me? Is it one of my well-looking days, child? Am I in face today? Perfectly, my dear. Yet, now I look again. Oh, bless me. Sure no accident has happened amongst the canary birds or the goldfishes. Has your brother or the cat been meddling? Or has the last novel been too moving? No, nothing of all this. I have been threatened. I can scarce get it out. I have been threatened with a lover. And his name? Is Marlowe. Indeed. The son of Sir Charles Marlowe. As I live, the most intimate friend of Mr. Hastings, my admirer. They are never asunder. I believe you must have seen him when we lived in town. Never. He is a very singular character, I assure you. Among women of reputation and virtue, he is the most modest man alive. But his acquaintance give him a very different character among creatures of another stamp. You understand me? An odd character indeed. I shall never be able to manage him. What shall I do? Pshaw, think no more of him, but trust to occurrences for success. But how goes on your own affair, my dear? Has my mother been courting you for my brother Tony as usual? I have just come from one of our agreeable tete-a-tetes. She has been saying a hundred tender things and setting off her pretty monster as the very pink of perfection. And her partiality is such that she actually thinks him so. A fortune like yours is no small temptation. Besides, as she has the sole management of it, I'm not surprised to see her unwilling to let it go out of the family. A fortune like mine, which chiefly consists in jewels, is no such mighty temptation. But at any rate, if my dear Hastings be but constant, I make no doubt to be too hard for her at last. However, I let her suppose I am in love with her son, and she never once dreams that my affections are fixed upon another. My good brother holds out stoutly. I could almost love him for hating you so. It is a good-natured creature at bottom, and I'm sure would see me married to anyone but himself. But my aunt's bell rings for our afternoon's walk round the improvements. Allons, courage is necessary, as our affairs are critical. Would it were bedtime, and all were well. Exeunt. Scene, an alehouse room. Several shabby fellows with punch and tobacco. Tony at the head of the table, a little higher than the rest, a mallet in his hand. Hooray! Hooray! Hooray. Bravo! Bravo. Now, gentlemen, silence for a song. Your squire's going to knock himself down for a song. Aye, a song. A song. Then I'll sing you, gentlemen, a song I made upon this alehouse, The Three Pigeons. Let schoolmasters puzzle their brain with grammar and nonsense and learning. Good liquor, I stoutly maintain, gives Janice a better discerning. Let them brag of their heathenish gods, their lethes, their sticks, and stigeons, their quists and their quades and their quotes. They're all but a parcel of pigeons. Torudel, torudel, torol. When Methodist preachers come down, a preaching that drinking is sinful, I'll wager the rascals a crown. They always preach best with a skinful. But when you come down with your pence for a slice of their scurvy religion, I'll leave it to all good men of sense. But you, my good friend, are the pigeon. Torudel, torudel, torol. Then come, put the jorum about, and let us be merry and clever. Our hearts and our liquors are stout. Here's the three jolly pigeons forever. Let some cry up woodcock or hare, your bustards, your ducks, or your widgeons. But of all the gay birds in the air, here's a health to the three jolly pigeons. Tarudel, tarudel, tarudel. 
Bravo. 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 This squire has got spunk in him. I love to hear him sing. Bikis, he never gives us nothing that's low. Oh, damn anything that's low. I cannot bear it. The genteel thing is a genteel thing any time, if so be that a gentleman bees in a concatenation accordingly. I likes the maxim of it, Master Muggins. What, though I am obligated to dance a bear, a man may be a gentleman for all that. May this be a poison, if my bear ever dances but to the very genteelest of tunes, Water Parted or the Minuet in Ariadne. What a pity. It is a squire is not come to his own. It would be well for all the publicans within ten miles round of him. A cod. And so it would, Master Slang. I'd then show what it was to keep choice of company. Oh, he takes after his own father for that. To be sure, old Squire Lumpkin was the finest gentleman I ever set my eyes on for winding the straight horn or beating a thicket for a hare or a wench he never had his fellow it was a saying in the place that he kept the best horses dogs and girls in the whole county Ecod! and when i'm of age i'll be no bastard i promise you i have been thinking of bet bouncer and the miller's grey mare to begin with but come my boys drink about and be merry for you pay no reckoning well, Stingo, what's the matter? Enter Landlord. There be two gentlemen in a post-chase at the door. They've lost their way upon the forest, and they're talking something about Mr. Hardcastle. As sure as can be, one of them must be the gentleman that's coming down to court my sister. Do they seem to be Londoners? I believe they may. They look wonderly like Frenchmen. Then desire them to step this way, and I'll set them right in a twinkling. Exit Landlord. Gentlemen, as they mayn't be good enough company for you, step down for a moment, and I'll be with you in the squeezing of a lemon. Exeunt Mob. Solace. Father-in-law has been calling me whelp and hound this half year. Now, if I pleased, I could be so revenged upon the old Grumbletonian. But then I'm afraid. Afraid of what? I shall soon be worth fifteen hundred a year. And let him frighten me out of that, if he can. Enter Landlord, conducting Marlowe and Hastings. What a tedious, uncomfortable day have we had of it. We were told it was but forty miles across the country, and we have come about threescore. And all, Marlowe, from that unaccountable reserve of yours, that would not let us inquire more frequently on the way. I own, Hastings, I am unwilling to lay myself under an obligation to every one I meet and often stand the chance of an unmannerly answer. At present, however, we are not likely to receive any answer. No offence, gentlemen, but I'm told you have been inquiring for one Mr. Hardcastle in these parts. Do you know what part of the country you are in? Not in the least, sir, but should thank you for information. Nor the way you came? No, sir, but if you can inform us... Why, gentlemen, if you know neither the road you are going nor where you are, nor the road you came, the first thing I have to inform you is that you have lost your way. We wanted no ghost to tell us that. Pray, gentlemen, may I be so bold as to ask the place from whence you came? That's not necessary towards directing us where we are to go. No offence, but question for question is all fair, you know. Pray, gentlemen, is not this same Hardcastle a cross-grained, old-fashioned, whimsical fellow with an ugly face, a daughter, and a pretty son? We have not seen the gentleman, but he has the family you mention. The daughter, a tall, trapesing, trolloping, talkative maypole. The son, a pretty, well-bred, agreeable youth that everybody is fond of. Our information differs in this. The daughter is said to be well-bred and beautiful. The son, an awkward booby, reared up and spoiled at his mother's apron string. <laughs> <coughs> then, gentlemen, all I have to tell you is that you won't reach Mr. Hardcastle's house this night, I believe. Unfortunate. Oh, it's a damned long, dark, boggy, dirty, dangerous way. Stingo, tell the gentleman the way to Mr. Hardcastle's. Winking upon the landlord. 
Mr. Hardcastles of Quagmire Marsh, you understand me? Master Hardcastles? Lock a daisy, my masters, you come a deadly deal wrong. When you came to the bottom of the hill, you should have crossed down Squash Lane. Crossed on Squash Lane? Then you were to keep straight forward till you came to four roads. Come to where four roads meet? Aye, but you must be sure to take only one of them. Oh, sir, you're facetious. Then, keeping to the right, you are to go sideways till you come upon Crackskull Common. There you must look sharp for the track of the wheel, and go forward till you come to Farmer Murrin's barn. Coming to the farmer's barn, you are to turn to the right, and then to the left, and then to the right about again, till you find the old mill. Zounds, man. We could as soon find out the longitude. What's to be done, Marlow? This house promises but poor reception, though perhaps the landlord can accommodate us. Alack, master, we have but one spare bed in the whole house. And to my knowledge, that's taken up by three lodgers already. After a pause, in which the rest seem disconcerted. I have hit it! Don't you think, Stingo, our landlady could accommodate the gentleman by the fireside with three chairs and a bolster? I hate sleeping by the fireside. And I detest you three chairs and a bolster. You do, do you? Then let me see. What if you go on a mile further to the buck's head? The old buck's head on the hill, one of the best inns in the whole county. Oh, ho! So we have escaped an adventure for this night, however. Apart to Tony. Sure, you've been sending them to your fathers as an inn, be you? Mom, you fool you, let them find that out. To them. You have only to keep on straight forward till you come to a large old house by the roadside. You'll see a pair of large horns over the door. That's the sign. Drive up the yard and call stoutly about you. Sir, we are obliged to you. The servants can't miss the way. No, no. But I tell you, though, the landlord is rich and going to leave off business. So he wants to be thought a gentleman saving your presence. <laughs> he'll be for giving you his company and, ecod, if you mind him, he'll persuade you that his mother was an alderman and his aunt a justice of peace. A troublesome old blade, to be sure but it keeps as good wines and beds as any in the whole country. Well, if he supplies us with these, we shall want no further connection. We are to turn to the right, did you say? No, no, straight forward. I'll just step myself and show you a piece of the way. To the landlord. Mom. Ah, bless your heart for a sweet, pleasant, damn mischievous son of a whore. Exeunt. End of Act One. Act Two of She Stoops to Conquer. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. She Stoops to Conquer by Oliver Goldsmith. Act the Second. Scene An Old Fashioned House. Enter Hardcastle, followed by three or four awkward servants. Well, I hope you are perfect at the table exercise I have been teaching you these three days. You all know your posts and your places, and can show that you have been used to good company, without ever stirring from home. Aye, aye, aye. When company comes, you are not to pop out and stare, and then run in again, like frightened rabbits in a warren. No, no, no. no. You, Diggory, whom I have taken from the barn, are to make a show at the side table. And you, Roger, whom I have advanced from the plough, are to place yourself behind my chair. But you're not to stand so with your hands in your pockets. Take your hands from your pockets, Roger, and from your head, you blockhead, you. See how Diggory carries his hands? They're a little stiff, indeed, but that's no great matter. Ah, uh, mind uh, I hold them. I learned to hold my hands this way when I was upon drill for the militia. And so being upon drill... You must not be so talkative, Diggory. You must be all attention to your guests. You must hear us talk and not think of talking. You must see us drink and not think of drinking. You must see us eat and not think of eating. By the Lord, your worship, that's perfectly impossible. Whenever Diggory sees eating going forward, it could, 
he's always wishing for a mouthful himself blockhead it's not a bellyful in the kitchen as good as a bellyful in the parlour stay your stomach with that reflection ecod i thank your worship i'll make a shift to stay my stomach with a slice of cold beef in the pantry diggory you are too talkative then if i happen to say a good thing or tell a good story at table you must not burst out a laughing as if you made part of the company then ecod your worship must not tell a story of old grouse in the gun-room i can't help laughing at that <laughs> for the soul of me we have laughed at that these twenty years <laughs> <laughs> the story is a good one well honest diggory you may laugh at that but still remember to be attentive suppose one of the company should call for a glass of wine how will you behave a glass of wine sir if you please to diggory eh why don't you move eh god your worship i never have courage till i see the eatables and drinkables brought upon the table and then i'm as bold as a lion what will nobody move i'm not to leave this place i'm sure it's no place of mine no mine for certain Wounds, and i'm sure it can be mine you numbskulls and so while like your betters you are quarrelling for places the guests must be starved oh you dunces i find i must begin all over again but don't i hear a coach drive into the yard to your posts you blockheads i'll go in the meantime and give my old friend's son a hearty reception at the gate exit hardcastle by the elevens my place is going quite out of my head i know that my place is to be everywhere where the devil is mine my place is to be nowhere at all so i go about my business Exeunt servants, running about as if frightened, different ways. Enter servant with candles, showing in Marlowe and Hastings. Welcome, gentlemen. Very welcome. This way. After the disappointments of the day, welcome once more, Charles, to the comforts of a clean room and a good fire. Upon my word, very well-looking house. Antique, but credible. The usual fate of a large mansion. Having ruined the master by good housekeeping, it at last comes to levy contributions as an inn. As you say, we passengers are to be taxed to pay for all these fineries. I have often seen a good sideboard, or a marble chimney-piece, though not actually put in the bill, inflame a reckoning confoundedly. Travellers, George, must pay in all places. The only difference is that in good inns you pay dearly for luxuries. In bad inns you are fleeced and starved. You have lived very much among them. In truth, I have been often surprised that you, who have seen so much of the world, with your natural good sense and your many opportunities, could never yet acquire a requisite share of assurance. The Englishman's malady. But tell me, George, where could I have learned that assurance you talk of? My life has been chiefly spent in a college or an inn, in seclusion from that lovely part of the creation that chiefly teach men confidence. I don't know that I was ever familiarly acquainted with a single modest woman except my mother but among females of another class you know ay among them you are impudent enough of all conscience they are of us you know but in the company of women of reputation i never saw such an idiot such a trembler you look for all the world as if you wanted an opportunity of stealing out of the room why man that's because i do want to steal out of the room faith i have often formed a resolution to break the ice and rattle away at any rate but i don't know how a single glance from a pair of fine eyes has totally overset my resolution an impudent fellow may counterfeit modesty but i will be hanged if a modest man can ever counterfeit impudence if you could but say half of the fine things to them that i have heard you lavish upon a barmaid of an inn or even a college bedmaker why george i can't say fine things to them they freeze they petrify me they may talk of a comet or a burning mountain or some such bagatelle but to me a modest woman dressed out in all her finery 
is the most tremendous object of the whole creation. <laughs> At this rate, man, how can you ever expect to marry? Never, unless, as among kings and princes, my bride were to be courted by proxy. If, indeed, like an eastern bridegroom, one were to be introduced to a wife he never saw before, it might be endured. But to go through all the terrors of formal courtship, together with the episode of aunts, grandmothers, and cousins, and at last to blurt out the broad, staring question of, Madam, will you marry me? No, no, that's a strain much above me, I assure you. I pity you, but how do you intend behaving to the lady you are come down to visit at the request of your father? As I behave to all other ladies, bow very low, answer yes or no to all her demands, but for the rest, I don't think I shall venture to look in her face till I see my father's again. I am surprised that one who is so warm a friend can be so cool a lover. To be explicit, my dear Hastings, my chief inducement down was to be instrumental in forwarding your happiness, not my own. Miss Neville loves you. The family don't know you. As my friend, you are sure of a reception. And let Horner do the rest. My dear Marlowe, I'll suppress the emotion. Were I a wretch, meanly seeking to carry off a fortune, you should be the last man in the world I would apply to for assistance. But Miss Neville's person is all I ask, and that is mine, both from her deceased father's consent and her own inclination. Happy man, you have talents and art to captivate any woman. I am doomed to adore the sex, and yet to converse with the only part of it I despise. This stammer in my address, and this awkward prepossessing visage of mine, can never permit me to soar above the reach of Milanus Prentice, or one of the duchesses of Drury Lane. Pasha, this fellow here to interrupt us. Enter Hardcastle. Gentlemen, once more you are heartily welcome. Which is Mr. Marlowe? Sir, you are heartily welcome. It's not my way, you see, to receive my friends with my back to the fire. I like to give them a hearty reception in the old style at my gate. I like to see their horses and trunks taken care of. Aside. He has got our names from the servants already. To him. We approve your caution and hospitality, sir. To Hastings. I have been thinking, George, of changing our travelling dresses in the morning. I am grown confoundedly ashamed of mine. I beg, Mr. Marlowe, you'll use no ceremony in this house. I fancy, Charles, you're right. The first blow is half the battle. I intend opening the campaign with the white and gold. Mr. Marlowe, Mr. Hastings, gentlemen, pray be under no constraint in this house. This is Liberty Hall, gentlemen. You may do just as you please here. Yet, George, if we open the campaign too fiercely at first, we may want ammunition before it's over. I think to reserve the embroidery to secure a retreat. Your talking of a retreat, Mr. Marlowe, puts me in mind of the Duke of Marlborough when we went to besiege Denain. He first summoned the garrison. Don't you think the wanted the waistcoat will do with a plain brown? He first summoned the garrison, which might consist of about five thousand men. I think not. Brown and yellow mix but very poorly. I say, gentlemen, as I was telling you, he summoned the garrison, which might consist of about five thousand men. The girls like finery which might consist of about five thousand men, well appointed with stores, ammunition, and other implements of war. Now, says the Duke of Marlborough to George Brooks that stood next to him, you must have heard of George Brooks, I'll pawn my dukedom, says he, but I take that garrison without spilling a drop of blood. So— What, my good friend, if you have a glass of punch in the meantime— it would help us carry on the siege with vigour. Punch, sir. Aside. This is the most unaccountable kind of modesty I have ever met with. Yes, sir, punch. A glass of warm punch after our journey will be comfortable. This is Liberty Hall, you know. Here's a cup, sir. Aside. So this fellow, in his Liberty Hall, will only let us have just what he pleases taking the cup. I hope you'll find it to your mind I have prepared it with my own hands, and I believe you'll own the ingredients are tolerable. Will you be so good as to pledge me, sir? 
Here, Mr. Marlowe, here is to our better acquaintance. Drinks. Aside. A very impudent fellow, this. But he has a character, and I will humor him a little. Sir, my service to you. Drinks. Aside. I see this fellow wants to give us his company, and forgets that he's an innkeeper, before he has learned to be a gentleman. From the excellence of your cup, my old friend, I suppose you have a good deal of business in this part of the country. Warm work, now and then, at elections, I suppose. No, sir, I have long given that work over. Since our betters have hit upon the expedient of electing each other, there is no business for us that sell ale. So then, you have no turn for politics, I find. Not in the least. There was a time, indeed, I fretted myself about the mistakes of government like other people. But finding myself every day grow more angry, and the government growing no better, I left it to mend itself. Since that, I no more trouble my head about Hyder Alley or Alley Khan than about Alley Croker. Sir, my service to you. So that with eating above stairs, and drinking below, with receiving your friends within, and amusing them without, you lead a good, pleasant, bustling life of it. I do stir about a great deal, that's certain. Half the differences of the parish are adjusted in this very parlour. After drinking. And you have an argument in your cup, old gentleman, better than any in Westminster Hall? Aye, young gentleman, that and a little philosophy. Aside. Well, this is the first time I ever heard an innkeeper's philosophy. So then, like an experienced general, you attack them on every quarter. If you find their reason manageable, you attack it with your philosophy. If you find they have no reason, you attack them with this. Here's your health, my philosopher. Drinks. Good, very good. Thank you. Ha <laughs> ha! Your generalship puts me in the mind of Prince Eugene when he fought the Turks at the Battle of Belgrade. You shall hear. Instead of the Battle of Belgrade, I believe it's almost time to talk about supper. What's your philosophy got in the house for supper? For supper, sir? Aside. Was ever such a request to a man in his own house? Yes, sir. Supper, sir. I begin to feel an appetite. I shall make a devilish work tonight in the larder. I promise you. Aside. Such a brazen dog sure never my eyes beheld. To him. Why, really, sir, as for supper, I can't well tell. My Dorothy and the cookmaid settle these things between them. I leave these kinds of things entirely to them. You do, do you? Uh, entirely. By the by, I believe they are in actual consultation about what's for supper this moment in the kitchen. Then I beg they will admit me as one of their privy council. It's a way I've got. When I travel, I always choose to regulate my own supper. Let the cook be called. No offence, I hope, sir. Oh, no, sir, not in the least. Yet, I don't know how, our Bridget, the cookmaid, is not very communicative upon these occasions. Should we send for her, she might scold us all out of the house. Let's see your list of the larder, then. I ask it as a favor. I always match my appetite to my bill of fare. To Hardcastle, who looks at them with surprise. Sir, he is very right, and it's my way to. Sir, you have a right to command here. Here, Roger, bring us the bill of fare for tonight's supper. I believe it's drawn out. Your manner, Mr. Hastings, puts me in mind of my uncle, Colonel Wallop. It was a saying of his that no man was sure of his supper till he had eaten it. Aside. All upon the high rope. His uncle a colonel. We shall soon hear of his mother being a justice of the peace. But let's hear the bill of fare. Perusing. What's here? For the first course, for the second course, for the desert. The devil! Sir, do you think we have brought down a whole joiner's company, or the corporation of Bedford, to eat up such a supper? Two or three little things, clean and comfortable, will do. But let's hear it. Reading. For the first course, at the top, a pig and prune sauce. Damn your pig, I say. 
and damn your prune sauce say i and yet gentlemen to men that are hungry pig with prune sauce is very good eating at the bottom a cough stung and brains let your brains be knocked out my good sir i don't like them or you may clap them on a plate by themselves i do aside their impudence confounds me to them gentlemen you are my guests make what alterations you please is there anything else you wish to retrench or alter gentlemen item a pork pie a boiled rabbit and sausages a florentine a shaking pudding and a dish of tiff taff taffety cream confound your made dishes i shall be as much at a loss in this house as at a green and yellow dinner at the french ambassador's table i'm for plain eating i am sorry gentlemen that i have nothing you like but if there be anything you have a particular fancy to why really sir your bill of fare is so exquisite that any one part of it is full as good as another send us what you please so much for supper and now to see that your beds are aired and properly taken care of i entreat you'll leave that to me you shall not stir a step leave that to you i protest sir you must excuse me i always look at these things myself i must insist sir you'll make yourself easy on that head you see i am resolved on it aside a very troublesome fellow this as i ever met with well sir i am resolved at least to attend you aside this may be modern modesty but i never saw anything look so like old-fashioned impudence exeunt marlowe and hardcastle alone so i find this fellow's civilities begin to grow troublesome but who can be angry at those assiduities which are meant to please him ha what do i see miss neville by all that's happy enter miss neville my dear hastings to what unexpected good fortune to what accident am i to ascribe this happy meeting rather let me ask the same question as i could never have hoped to meet my dearest constance at an inn an inn sure you mistake my aunt my guardian lives here what could induce you to think this house an inn my friend mr marlowe with whom i came down and i have been sent here as to an inn i assure you a young fellow whom we accidentally met at a house hard by directed us hither certainly it would be one of my hopeful cousin's tricks of whom you've heard me talk about so often <laughs> he whom your aunt intends for you he of whom i have such just apprehensions you have nothing to fear from him i assure you you'd adore him if you knew how heartily he despises me my aunt knows it too and has undertaken to court me for him and actually begins to think she has made a conquest thou dear dissembler you must know my constance I have just seized this happy opportunity of my friend's visit here to get admittance into the family. The horses that carried us down here are now fatigued with their journey, but they'll soon be refreshed. And then, if my dearest girl will trust in her faithful Hastings, we shall soon be landed in France, where even among slaves the laws of marriage are respected. I have often told you that, though ready to obey you, I yet should leave my little fortune behind with reluctance. The greatest part of it was left to me by my uncle, the Indian director, and chiefly consists in jewels. I have been for some time persuading my aunt to let me wear them. I fancy I'm near succeeding. The instant they put them in my possession, you shall find me ready to make them and myself yours. Perish the baubles! Your person is all I desire. In the meantime, my friend Marlowe must not be let into his mistake. I know the strange reserve of his temper is such that if abruptly informed of it, he would instantly quit the house before our plan was ripe for execution. But how shall we keep him in the deception? Miss Hardcastle is just returning from walk. What if we still continue to deceive them? This way, this way. They confer. Enter Marlowe. The assiduities of these good people tease me beyond bearing. My host seems to think it ill manners to leave me alone, and so he claps not only himself, but his old-fashioned wife on my back. They talk of coming to sup with us too, and then I suppose we are to run the gantlet through all the rest of the family. What have we got here? My dear Charles, let me congratulate you. The most fortunate accident. Who do you think is just alighted? Cannot guess. 
our mistresses boy miss hardcastle and miss neville give me leave to introduce miss constance neville to your acquaintance happening to dine in the neighborhood they called on their return to take fresh horses here miss hardcastle has just stepped into the next room and will be back in an instant wasn't it lucky eh aside i have been mortified enough of all conscience and here comes something to complete my embarrassment well but wasn't it the most fortunate thing in the world oh yes very fortunate a most joyful encounter but our dresses george you know are in disorder what if we should postpone the happiness till tomorrow tomorrow at our own house it will be every bit as convenient and rather more respectful tomorrow let it be offering to go by no means sir your ceremony will displease her the disorder of your dress will show the ardour of your impatience besides she knows you're in the house and will permit you to see her oh the devil how shall i support it hem hem hastings you must not go you are to assist me you know i shall be confoundedly ridiculous yet hang it i'll take courage hem pshaw man it's with the first plunge and it's all over she's but a woman you know and of all women she that i dread most to encounter enter miss hardcastle as returned from walking a bonnet etc introducing them miss hardcastle mr marlowe i'm proud of bringing two persons of such merit together that only want to know to esteem each other aside now for meeting my modest gentleman with a demure face and quite in his own manner after a pause in which he appears very uneasy and disconcerted i'm glad of your safe arrival sir i'm told you had some accidents by the way only a few madam yes we had some yes madam a good many accidents but should be sorry madam or rather glad of any accidents they are so agreeably concluded him to him you never spoke better in your whole life keep it up and i'll ensure you the victory i'm afraid you flatter sir you that have seen so much of the finest company can find little entertainment in an obscure corner of the country gathering courage i have lived indeed in the world madam but i have kept very little company i have been but an observer upon life madam while others were enjoying it but that i am told is the way to enjoy it at last to him cicero never spoke better once more and you are confirmed in assurance for ever to him him stand by me then and when i am down throw in a word or two to set me up again an observer like you upon life were i fear disagreeably employed since you must have had much more to censure than to approve pardon me madam i was always willing to be amused the folly of most people is rather an object of mirth than uneasiness to him bravo bravo never spoke so well in your whole life well miss hardcastle i see that you and mr marlowe are going to be very good company i believe our being here will but embarrass the interview not in the least mr hastings we like your company of all things to him zounds george sure you won't go how can you leave us our presence will but spoil conversation so we'll retire to the next room to him you don't consider man that we are to manage a little tete-a-tete -tete of our own exeunt after a pause but you have not been wholly an observer i presume sir the ladies i should hope have employed some part of your addresses relapsing into timidity pardon me madam i i i as yet have studied only to deserve them and that some say is the very worst way to obtain them perhaps so madam but i love to converse only with more grave and sensible part of the sex but i am afraid i grow tiresome not at all sir there is nothing i like so much as grave conversation myself i could hear it for ever indeed i have often been surprised how a man of sentiment could ever admire those light airy pleasures where nothing reaches the heart it's a disease of the mind madam in the variety of taste there must be some who wanting a relish for um uh, um i understand you sir there must be some who 
wanting a relish for refined pleasures, pretend to despise what they are incapable of tasting. My meaning, madam, but infinitely better expressed, and I can't help observing. Uh. Aside. Who could ever suppose this fellow impudent upon some occasions? To him. You were going to observe, sir. I was observing, madam. I protest, madam. I forget what I was going to observe. Aside. I vow, and so do I. To him. You were observing, sir, that in this age of hypocrisy... Something about hypocrisy, sir. Yes, madam. In this age of hypocrisy, there are few upon strict inquiry do not... Uh... 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 I understand you perfectly, sir. Aside. Egad. And that's more than I do myself. You mean that in this hypocritical age there are few that do not condemn in public what they practice in private, and think they pay every debt to virtue when they praise it? True, madam. Those who have most virtue in their mouths have least of it in their bosoms. But I'm sure I tire you, madam. Not in the least, sir. There's something so agreeable and spirited in your manner, such life and force. Pray, sir, go on. Yes, madam. I was saying that there are some occasions when a total want of courage, madam, destroys all the and puts us upon a, a, a... I agree with you entirely. A want of courage upon some occasions assumes the appearance of ignorance and betrays us when we most want to excel. I beg you'll proceed. Yes, madam. Morally speaking, madam. But I see Miss Neville expecting us in the next room. I would not intrude for the world. I protest, sir. I never was more agreeably entertained in all my life. Pray, go on. Yes, madam. I was. But she beckons us to join her. Madam, shall I do myself the honour to attend you? Well, then, I'll follow. Aside. This pretty much smooth dialogue has done for me. Exit. Alone. <laughs> Was there ever such a sober, sentimental interview? I'm certain he scarce looked in my face the whole time. Yet the fellow, but for his unaccountable bashfulness, is pretty well too. He has good sense, but then so buried in his fears that it fatigues one more than ignorance. If I could teach him a little confidence, it would be doing somebody that I know of a piece of service. But who is that somebody? That, faith, is a question I can scarce answer. Exit. Enter Tony and Miss Neville, followed by Mrs. Hardcastle and Hastings. What do you follow me for, Cousin Con? I wonder you're not ashamed to be so very engaging. I hope, Cousin, one may speak to one's own relations and not be to blame. Aye, but I know what sort of a relation you want to make me, though. But it won't do. I tell you, Cousin Con, it won't do. So I beg you'll keep your distance. I want no nearer relationship. She follows, coquetting him to the back scene. Well, I vow, Mr. Hastings, you are very entertaining. There's nothing in the world I love to talk of so much as London and the fashions, though I was never there myself. Never there? You amaze me. From your air and manner, I concluded you had been bred all your life, either at Ranelagh, St. James's, or Tower Wharf. Oh, sir, you're only pleased to say so. We country persons can have no manner at all. I'm in love with the town, and that serves to raise me above some of our neighboring rustics. But who can have a manner that has never seen the Pantheon, the Grotto Gardens, the Burrow, and such places where the nobility chiefly resort? All I can do is to enjoy London at second hand. I take care to know every tete-a-tete -tete from the scandalous magazine and have all the fashions as they come out in a letter from the two Miss Ricketts of Crooked Lane. Pray, how do you like this head, Mr. Hastings? Extremely elegant and dégagé, upon my word, madame. Your freezer is a Frenchman, I suppose. I protest. I dressed it myself from a print in the ladies' memorandum book for the last year. Indeed. Such a head in a side-box at the playhouse would draw as many gazers as my lady mayoress at a city ball. 
i vow since inoculation began there is no such thing to be seen as a plain woman so one must dress a little particular or one may escape in the crowd but that can never be your case madame in any dress bowing yet what signifies my dressing when i have such a piece of antiquity by my side as mr hardcastle all i can say will never argue down a single button from his clothes i have often wanted him to throw off his great flaxen wig and where he was bald to plaster it over like my lord pateley with powder you are right madame for as among the ladies there are none ugly so among the men there are none old but what do you think his answer was why with his usual gothic vivacity he said i only wanted him to throw off his wig to convert it into a tet for my own wearing intolerable at your age you may wear what you please and it must become you pray mr hastings what do you take to be the most fashionable age about town some time ago forty was all the mode but i'm told the ladies intend to bring up fifty for the ensuing winter seriously then i shall be too young for the fashion no lady begins now to put on jewels till she's past forty for instance miss there in a polite circle would be considered as a child as a mere maker of samplers and yet mrs niece thinks herself as much a woman and is as fond of jewels as the oldest of us all your niece is she and that young gentleman a brother of yours i should presume my son sir they are contracted to each other observe their little sports they fall in and out ten times a day as if they were man and wife already to them well tony child what soft things are you saying to your cousin constance this evening i have been saying no soft things but that it's very hard to be followed about ecod i've not a place in the house now that's left to myself but the stable never mind him con my dear he's in another story behind your back there's something generous in my cousin's manner he falls out before faces to be forgiven in privates that's a damned confounded crack ah he's a sly one don't you think they are like each other about the mouth mr hastings the blanking sop mouth to a t they're of a size too back to back my pretties that mr hastings may see you come tony you had as good not make me i tell you measuring oh lads he has almost cracked my head oh the monster for shame tony you a man and behave so if i'm a man let me have my fortin ecod i'll not be made a fool of no longer is this ungrateful boy all that i'm to get for the pains i have taken in your education i that have rocked you in your cradle and fed that pretty mouth with a spoon did not i work that waistcoat to make you genteel did not i prescribe for you every day and weep while the receipt was operating ecod you had reason to weep for you have been dousing me ever since i was born i have gone through every recipe in the complete housewife ten times over and you have thoughts of coursing me through quinsy next spring but he caught i tell you i'll not be made a fool of no longer wasn't it all for your good viper wasn't it all for your good i wish you'd let me and my good alone then snubbing this way when i'm in spirits if i'm to have any good let it come of itself not to keep dinging it dinging it into one so that's false i never see you when you're in spirits no tony you then go to the alehouse or kennel i'm never to be delighted with your agreeable wild notes unfeeling monster ecod mamma your own notes are the wildest of the two was ever the like but i see he wants to break my heart i see he does dear madam permit me to lecture the young gentleman a little i'm certain i can persuade him to do his duty well i must retire come constance my love you see mr hastings the wretchedness of my situation was ever poor woman so plagued with a dear sweet pretty provoking undutiful boy exeunt mrs hardcastle and miss neville 
there was a young man riding by and fain would have his will rang do diddly dee don't mind her let her cry it's the comfort of her heart i have seen her and her sister cry over a book for an hour together and they said the like the book the better the more it made them cry then you're no friend to the ladies i find my pretty young gentleman that's as i find them not to her of your mother's choosing i dare answer and yet she appears to me a pretty well-tempered girl that's because you don't know her as well as i he cod i know every inch about her and there's not a more bitter cantankerous toad in all christendom aside pretty encouragement this for a lover i have seen her since the height of that she has as many tricks as a hare in a thicket or a colt the first day is breaking to me she appears sensible and silent ay before company but when she's with her playmate she's as loud as a hog in a gate but there is a meek modesty about her that charms me yes but curb her never so little she kicks up and you're flung in a ditch well but you must allow her a little beauty yes you must allow her some beauty bandbox she's all a made-up thing mon ah could you but see bet bouncer of these parts you might then talk of beauty ecod she has two eyes as black as sloes and cheeks as broad and red as a pulpit cushion she'd make two of she well what say you to a friend that would take this bitter bargain off your hands on on would you thank him that would take miss neville and leave you to happiness and your dear betsy ay but where is there such a friend for who would take her i am he if you but assist me i'll engage to whip her off to france and you shall never hear more of her assist you he caught i will to the last drop of my blood i'll clap a pair of horses to your chaise that will trundle you off in a twinkling and may he get you a part of her fortin beside in jewels that you little dream of my dear squire this looks like a lad of spirit come along then and you shall see more of my spirit before you have done with me we are the boys that fears no noise where thundering cannons roar exeunt end of act two Act Three of She Stoops to Conquer. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. She Stoops to Conquer by Oliver Goldsmith. Act the Third. Enter Hardcastle alone. What could my old friend Sir Charles mean by recommending his son as the modestest young man in town? to me he appears the most impudent piece of brass that ever spoke with a tongue he has taken possession of the easy-chair by the fireside already he took off his boots in the parlour and desired me to see them taken care of i am desirous to know how his impudence affects my daughter she will certainly be shocked at it enter miss hardcastle plainly dressed well my kate i see you have changed your dress as i bade you and yet i believe there was no great occasion i find such a pleasure sir in obeying your commands that i take care to observe them without ever debating their propriety and yet kate i sometimes give you some cause particularly when i recommended my modest gentleman to you as a lover to-day you taught me to expect something extraordinary and i find the original exceeds the description i was never so surprised in my life he has quite confounded all my faculties i never saw anything like it and a man of the world too ay he learned it all abroad what a fool was i to think a young man could learn modesty by travelling he might as soon learn wit at a masquerade it seems all natural to him a good deal assisted by bad company and a french dancing master surely you mistake papa a french dancing master could never have taught him that timid look that awkward address that bashful manner whose look whose manner child mr marlowe's his mauvaise aunt his timidity struck me at the first sight then your first sight deceived you for i think him one of the most brazen first sights that ever astonished my senses sure sir you rally i never saw any one so modest and can you be serious 
I never saw such a bouncing, swaggering puppy since I was born. Bully Dawson was but a fool to him. Surprising. He met me with a respectful bow, a stammering voice, and a look fixed on the ground. He met me with a loud voice, a lordly air, and a familiarity that made my blood freeze again. He treated me with diffidence and respect, censured the manners of the age, admired the prudence of girls that never laughed, tired me with apologies for being tiresome, then left the room with a bow and, Madam, I would not for the world detain you. He spoke to me as if he knew me all his life before, asked twenty questions, and never waited for an answer, interrupted my best remarks with some silly pun, and when I was in my best story of the Duke of Marlborough and Prince Eugene, he asked if I had not a good hand at making punch. Yes, Kate, he asked your father if he was a maker of punch. One of us must certainly be mistaken. If he be what he has shown himself, I'm determined he shall never have my consent. And if he be the sullen thing I take him, he shall never have mine. In one thing, then, we are agreed, to reject him. Yes, but upon conditions. For if you should find him less impudent and I more presuming, if you find him more respectful and I more importunate, I don't know, the fellow is well enough for a man. Certainly we don't meet many such at a horse-race in the country. If we should find him so. But that's impossible. The first appearance has done my business. I am seldom deceived in that. And yet there may be many good qualities under that first appearance. Aye, when a girl finds a fellow's outside to her taste, she then sets about guessing the rest of his furniture. With her, a smooth face stands for good sense, and a genteel figure for every virtue. I hope, sir, a conversation begun with a compliment to my good sense won't end with a sneer at my understanding. Pardon me, Kate. But if the young Mr. Brazen can find the art of reconciling contradictions, he may please us both, perhaps. And as one of us must be mistaken, what if we go to make further discoveries? Agreed. But depend on it, I'm in the right. And depend upon it, I'm not much in the wrong. Exeunt. Enter Tony, running in with a casket. Ecod, I have got them! Here they are! My cousin Con's necklaces, bobs and all. My mother shan't cheat the poor souls out of their fortin neither. Ah, oh, my genus, is that you? Enter Hastings. My dear friend, how have you managed with your mother? I hope you have amused her with pretending love for your cousin, and that you are willing to be reconciled at last. Our horses will be refreshed in a short time, and we shall soon be ready to set off. And here's something to bear your charges, by the way. Giving the casket. Your sweetheart's jewels. Keep them, and hang those, I say, that would rob you of one of them. But how have you procured them from your mother? Ask me no questions, and I'll tell you no fibs. I procured them by the rule of thumb. If I had not a key to every drawer in mother's bureau, how could I go to the alehouse so often as I do? An honest man may rob himself of his own at any time. Thousands do it every day. But to be plain with you, Miss Neville is endeavouring to procure them from her aunt this very instant. If she succeeds, it will be the most delicate way, at least, of obtaining them. Well, keep them, till you know how it will be. But I know how it will be well enough, and she'd as soon part with the only sound tooth in her head. But I dread the effects of her resentment, when she finds she has lost them. Never you mind her resentment. Leave me to manage that. I don't value her resentment the bounce of a cracker. Sounds! Here they are! Morris! Prance! Exit Hastings. Enter Mrs. Hardcastle and Miss Neville. Indeed, Constance, you amaze me. Such a girl as you want jewels. It will be time enough for jewels, my dear, twenty years hence, when your beauty begins to want repairs. But what will repair beauty at forty will certainly improve it at twenty, madam. Yours, my dear, can admit of none. That natural blush is beyond a thousand ornaments. Besides, child, jewels are quite out at present. 
don't you see half the ladies of our acquaintance my lady kill daylight and mrs crump and the rest of them carry their jewels to town and bring nothing but paste and marcasites back but who knows madam but somebody that shall be nameless would like me best with all my finery about me consult your glass my dear and then see if with such a pair of eyes you want any better sparklers what do you think tony my dear does your cousin con want any jewels in your eyes to set off her beauty that's as therefore may be my dear aunt if you knew how it would oblige me a parcel of old-fashioned rose and table-cut things they would make you look like the court of king solomon at a puppet show besides i believe i can't readily come at them they may be missing for aught i know to the contrary apart to mrs hardcastle then why don't you tell her so at once as she's so longing for them tell her they're lost it's the only way to quiet her say they're lost and call me to bear witness apart to tony you know my dear i'm only keeping them for you so if i say they're gone you'll bear me witness will you <laughs> never fear me ecod i'll say i saw them taken out with my own eyes i desire them but for a day madam just to be permitted to show them as relics and then they might be locked up again to be plain with you my dear constance if i could find them you should have them they are missing i assure you lost for aught i know but we must have patience wherever they are i'll not believe it this is but a shallow pretence to deny me i know they are too valuable to be so slightly kept and as you are to answer for the loss don't be alarmed constance if they be lost i must restore an equivalent but my son knows they are missing and not to be found that i can bear witness to they are missing and not to be found i'll take my oath on it you must learn resignation my dear for though we lose our fortune yet we should not lose our patience see me how calm i am ay people are generally calm in the misfortunes of others now i wonder a girl of your good sense should waste a thought upon such trumpery we shall soon find them and in the meantime you shall make use of my garnets till your jewels be found i detest garnets the most becoming things in the world to set off a clear complexion you have often seen how well they look upon me you shall have them exit i dislike them of all things you shan't stir was ever anything so provoking to mislay my own jewels and force me to wear her trumpery don't be a fool if she gives you the garnets take what you can get the jewels are your own already I have stolen them out of her bureau, and she does not know it. Fly to your spark, he'll tell you more of the matter. Leave me to manage her. My dear cousin. Vanish. She's here, and has missed them already. Exit Miss Neville. Sounds. How she fidgets and spits about like a Catherine wheel. Enter Mrs. Hardcastle. Confusion, thieves, robbers. We are cheated, plundered, broke open, undone what's the matter what's the matter mamma i hope nothing has happened to any of the good family we are robbed my bureau has been broken open the jewels taken out and i'm undone oh is that all ha 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 by the laws i never saw it acted better in my life ecod i thought you was ruined in earnest ha 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 why boy i am ruined in earnest my bureau has been broken open and all taken away stick to that ha 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 stick to that i'll bear witness you know call me to bear witness i tell you tony by all that's precious the jewels are gone and i shall be ruined for ever sure i know they're gone and i'm to say so oh, my dearest tony but hear me they're gone i say by the laws, mamma, you make me for to laugh. Ha 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 ha! I know who took them well enough. Ha 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 ha! Oh, was there ever such a blockhead that can't tell the difference between jest and earnest? I tell you, I'm not in jest, booby. That's right, that's right. You must be in a bitter passion, and then nobody will suspect either of us. I'll bear witness that they're gone. 
Was there ever such a cross-grained brute that won't hear me? Can you bear witness that you know better than a fool? Oh, was ever poor woman so beset with fools on one hand and thieves on the other? I can bear witness to that. Bear witness again, you blockhead, you, and I'll turn you out of the room directly. Oh, my poor niece, what will become of her? Do you laugh, you unfeeling brute, as if you enjoyed my distress? I can bear witness to that. Do you insult me, monster? I'll teach you to vex your mother. I will. I can bear witness to that. He runs off. She follows him. Enter Miss Hardcastle and Maid. What an unaccountable creature is that brother of mine, to send them to the house as an inn. <laughs> I don't wonder at his impudence. But what is more, madam, the young gentleman, as you pass by in your present dress, asked me if you were the barmaid. He mistook you for the barmaid, madam. Did he? Then as I live, I'm resolved to keep up the delusion. Tell me, Pimple, how do you like my present dress? Don't you think I look something like Cherry in the Beau Stratagem? It's the dress, madam, that every lady wears in the country, but when she visits or receives company. And are you sure he does not remember my face or person? Certain of it. I vow I thought so, for though we spoke for some time together, yet his fears were such that he never once looked up during the interview. Indeed, if he had, my bonnet would have kept him from seeing me. But what do you hope from keeping him in his mistake? In the first place I shall be seen, and that is no small advantage to a girl who brings her face to market. Then I shall perhaps make an acquaintance, and that's no small victory, gained over one who never addresses any but the wildest of her sex. But my chief aim is to take my gentleman off his guard, and, like an invisible champion of romance, examine the giant's force before I offer to combat. But are you sure you can act your part? and disguise your voice so that he may mistake that, as he's already mistaken your person. Never fear me. I think I have got the true bar cant. Did your honour call? Attend the lion there. Pipes and tobacco for the angel. The lamb has been outrageous this half hour. It will do, madam. But he's here. Exit maid. Enter Marlowe. What a bowling in every part of the house. I have scarce a moment's repose. If I go to the best room... There I find my host and a story. If I fly to the gallery, there we have my hostess with a curtsy down to the ground. I have at last got a moment to myself. And now for recollection. Walks and muses. Did you call, sir? Did your honour call? Musing. As for Miss Hardcastle, she is too grave and sentimental for me. Did your honour call? She still places herself before him, he turning away. No, child. Musing. Besides, from the glimpse I had of her, I think she squints. I'm sure, sir, I heard the bell ring. No, no. Musing. I have pleased my father, however, by coming down, and I'll tomorrow please myself by returning. Taking out his tablets and perusing. Perhaps the other gentleman called, sir? I tell you, no. I should be glad to know, sir. We have such a parcel of servants. No, no, I tell you. Looks full in her face. Yes, child, I think I did call. I wanted, I wanted, I woo, child, you are vastly handsome. Oh, la, sir, you'll make one ashamed. Never saw a more sprightly, malicious eye. Yes, yes, my dear, I did call. Have you got any of your, uh, what do you call it in the house? No, sir. We have been out of that these ten days. One may call in this house, I find, to very little purpose. Suppose I should call for a taste, just by way of trial, of the nectar of your lips? Perhaps I might be disappointed in that too. Nectar? Nectar? That's a liquor there's no call for in these parts. French, I suppose. We sell no French wines here, sir. Of true English growth, I assure you. Then it's odd I should not know it. We brew all sorts of wines in this house, and I have lived here these eighteen years. Eighteen years? Why, one would think, child, you kept the bar before you were born. How old are you? Oh, sir, I must not tell my age. They say women and music should never be dated. 
To guess at this distance, you can't be much above forty. Approaching. Yet, nearer, I don't think so much. Approaching. By coming close to some women, they look younger still. But when we come very close indeed, attempting to kiss her. Pray, sir, keep your distance. One would think you wanted to know one's age as they do horses by mark of mouth. I protest, child. You use me extremely ill. If you keep me at this distance, how is it possible you and I can ever be acquainted? And who wants to be acquainted with you? I want no such acquaintance, not I. I'm sure you did not treat Miss Ardcastle, that was here a while ago, in this obstropolous manner. I'll warrant me, before her you looked dashed and kept bowing to the ground and talked, for all the world, as if you was before a justice of peace. Aside. Egad, she has hit it, sure enough. To her. In awe of her, child? Ha, ha, ha. A mere awkward squinting thing. No, no, I find you don't know me. I laughed and rallied her a little, but I was unwilling to be too severe. No, I could not be too severe. Curse me. Oh, then, sir, you are a favourite, I find, among the ladies. Yes, my dear, a great favourite. And yet, hang me, I don't see what they find in me to follow. At the ladies' club in town, I'm called their agreeable rattle. Rattle, child, is not my real name, but one I'm known by. My name is Solomon's. Mr. Solomon's, my dear, at your service. Offering to salute her. Old sir, you are introducing me to your club, not to yourself. And you're so great a favourite there, you say? Yes, my dear. There is Mrs. Mantrap, Lady Betty Blackleg, the Countess of Sligo, Mrs. Langhorns, old Miss Betty Buckskin, and your humble servant. Keep up the spirit of the place. Then it's a very merry place, I suppose. Yes, as merry as cards, supper, wine, and old women can make us. And their agreeable rattle. Ha, ha. Aside. Egad, I don't quite like this chit. She looks knowing, methinks. You laugh, child? I can't but laugh, to think what time they all have for minding their work or their family. Aside. All's well, she don't laugh at me. To her. Do you ever work, child? I sure. There's not a screen or quilt in the old house but what can bear witness to that. Odd so. Then you must show me your embroidery. I embroider and draw patterns myself a little. If you want a judge of your work, you must apply to me. Seizing her hand. Ay, but the colours do not look well by candlelight. You shall see all in the morning. Struggling. And why not now, my angel? Such beauty fires beyond the power of resistance. Pasha, the father here. My old luck. I never nicked seven that I did not throw. Aim says three times following. Exit Marlowe. Enter Hardcastle, who stands in surprise. So, madam, so I find this is your modest lover. This is your humble admirer that kept his eyes fixed on the ground and only adored at humble distance. Kate, Kate, art thou not ashamed to deceive your father so? Never trust me, dear papa, but he's still the modest man I first took him for. You'll be convinced of it as well as I. By the hand of my body, I believe his impudence is infectious. Didn't I see him seize your hand? Didn't I see him haul you about like a milkmaid? And now you talk of his respect and his modesty, forsooth. But if I shortly convince you of his modesty, that he has only the faults that will pass off with time, and the virtues that will improve with age, I hope you'll forgive him. The girl would actually make one run mad. I tell you, I'll not be convinced. I am convinced. He has scarce been three hours in the house, and he has already encroached on all my prerogatives. You may like his impudence and call it modesty, but my son-in-law, madam, must have very different qualifications. Sir, I ask but this night to convince you. You shall have not half the time, for I have thoughts of turning him out this very hour. Give me that hour, then, and I hope to satisfy you. Well, an hour let it be, then. 
but I'll have no trifling with your father. All fair and open, do you mind me? I hope, sir, you have ever found that I considered your commands as my pride, for your kindness is such that my duty as yet has been inclination. Exeunt. End of Act Three. Act Four of She Stoops to Conquer. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. She Stoops to Conquer by Oliver Goldsmith. Act the Fourth. Enter Hastings and Miss Neville. You surprise me. Sir Charles Marlowe expect to hear this night? Where have you had your information? You may depend upon it. I saw his letter to Mr. Hardcastle, in which he tells him he intends to set off a few hours after his son. Then, my Constance, all must be completed before he arrives. He knows me, and should he find me here, would discover my name, and perhaps my designs, to the rest of the family. The jewels, I hope, are safe. Yes, yes, I have sent them to Marlowe, who keeps the keys of our baggage. In the meantime, I'll go to prepare matters for our elopement. I have had the squire's promise of a fresh pair of horses, and if I should not see him again, will write him further directions. Exit. Well, success will attend you. In the meantime, I'll go and amuse my aunts, with the old pretense of a violent passion for my cousin. Exit. Enter Marlowe, followed by a servant. I wonder what Hastings could mean by sending me so valuable a thing as a casket to keep for him, when he knows the only place I have is the seat of a post-coach at an inn door. Have you deposited the casket with the landlady, as I ordered you? Have you put it into her own hands? Yes, Your Honour. She said she'd keep it safe, did she? Yes, she said she'd keep it safe enough. She asked me how I came by it, and she said she had a great mind to make me give an account to myself. Exit Servant Ha, ha, ha! They're safe. However, what an unaccountable set of beings have we got amongst. This little barmaid, though, runs in my head most strangely, and drives out the absurdities of all the rest of the family. She is mine. She must be mine. Or I am greatly mistaken. Enter Hastings. Bless me! I quite forgot to tell her that I intended to prepare at the bottom of the garden. Marlowe here, and in spirits, too. Give me joy, George. Crown me, shadow me with laurels. Well, George, after all, we modest fellows don't want for success among the women. Some women, you mean. But what success has your honor's modesty been crowned with now, that it grows so insolent upon us? Didn't you see the tempting, brisk, lovely little thing? that runs about the house with a bunch of keys to its griddle. Well, and what then? She's mine, you rogue, you. Such fire, such motion, such eyes, such lips. But, egad, she would not let me kiss them, though. Are you so sure, so very sure of her? Why, man, she talked of showing me her work above stairs, and I am to improve the pattern. But how can you, Charles, go about to rob a woman of her honour? Pasha, Pasha, we all know the honour of the barmaid of an inn. I don't intend to rob her. Take my word for it. There is nothing in this house I shan't honestly pay for. I believe the girl has virtue. And if she has, I should be the last man in the world that would attempt to corrupt it. You have taken care, I hope, of the casket I sent you to lock up. Is it in safety? Yes, yes. It's safe enough. I have taken care of it. But how could you think the seat of a post-coach at an indoor a place of safety? Ha, huh? Numskull, I have taken better precautions for you than you did for yourself. I have... What? I have sent it to the landlady to keep it for you. To the landlady? The landlady. You did? I did. She is to be answerable for its forthcoming, you know? Yes, she'll bring it forth with a witness. Wasn't I right? I believe you will allow that I acted prudently upon this occasion. Aside. He must not see my uneasiness. You seem a little disconcerted, though, methinks. Sure nothing has happened? No, nothing. Never was in better spirits in all my life. And so you left it with the landlady, who, no doubt, very readily undertook the charge. Rather too readily. For she not only kept the basket, but, through her great precaution, was going to keep the messenger too. Ha, ha, ha. <laughs> They're safe, however. As a guinea in a miser's purse. Aside. So now all hopes of fortune are at an end, and we must set off without it. To him. Well, Charles, 
I'll leave you to your meditations upon the pretty barmaid, and <laughs> may you be as successful for yourself as you have been for me. Exit. Thank ye, George. I ask no more. Ha ha ha. Enter Hardcastle. I no longer know my own house. It's turned all topsy turvy. His servants have got drunk already. I'll bear it no longer. And yet, from my respect for his father, I'll be calm. To him. Mr. Marlowe, your servant. I'm your very humble servant. Bowing low. Sir, your humble servant. Aside. What's to be the wonder now? I believe, sir, you must be sensible, sir, that no man alive ought to be more welcome than your father's son. I hope you think so. I do from my soul, sir. I don't want much entreaty. I generally make my father's son welcome wherever he goes. I believe you do from my soul, sir. But though I say nothing to your own conduct, that of your servants is insufferable. Their manner of drinking is setting a very bad example in this house, I assure you. I protest, my very good sir, that is no fault of mine. If they don't drink as they ought, they are to blame. I ordered them not to spare the cellar. I did, I assure you. To the side scene. Here, let one of my servants come up. To him. My positive directions were, that as I do not drink myself, they should make up for my deficiencies below. Then they had your orders for what they do? I'm satisfied. They had, I assure you. You shall hear from one of themselves. Enter servant, drunk. You, Jeremy, come forward, sirrah. What were my orders? Were you not told to drink freely? And call for what you thought fit, for the good of the house? Aside. I begin to lose my patience. Please, your honor, liberty and fleet street for ever though i am but a servant i am as good as another man i'll drink for no man before supper sir damn good liquor will sit upon a good supper but a good supper will not sit upon <coughs> on my conscience sir you see my old friend the fellow is as drunk as he can possibly be i don't know what you would have more unless you would have the poor devil soused in a beer barrel sounds he'll drive me distracted if i contain myself any longer mr marlow sir i have submitted to your insolence for more than four hours and i see no likelihood of its coming to an end i'm now resolved to be master here sir and i desire that you and your drunken pack may leave my house directly leave your house sure you jest my good friend what when i am doing what i can to please you i tell you sir you don't please me so i desire you'll leave my house sure you cannot be serious at this time of night and such a night you only mean to banter me i tell you sir i'm serious and now that my passions are roused i say this house is mine sir this house is mine and i command you to leave it directly ha 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 a puddle in storm i shan't stir a step i assure you this is your house fellow it's my house this is my house mine while i choose to stay what right have you to bid me leave this house sir i never met with such impudence curse me never in my whole life before nor i confound me if ever i did to come to my house to call for what he likes to turn me out of my own chair to insult the family to order his servants to get drunk and then to tell me this house is mine sir by all that's impudent it makes me laugh ha 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 pray sir as you take the house what think you of taking the rest of the furniture there's a pair of silver candlesticks and there's a fire screen and here's a pair of brazen-nosed bellows perhaps you may take a fancy to them bring me your bell sir bring me your bell and let's make no more words about it there are a set of prints too what think you of the brake's progress for your own apartment bring me your bell i say 
and I will leave you and your infernal house directly. Then there's a mahogany table that you may see your own face in. My bell, I say. I had forgot the great chair for your own particular slumbers after a hearty meal. Zounds, bring me my bell, I say, and let's hear no more on it. Young man, from your father's letter to me, I was taught to expect a well-bred modest man as a visitor here, but now I find him no better than a coxcomb and a bully. But he will be down here presently, and shall hear more of it. Exit. How's this? Sure I have not mistaken the house. Everything looks like an inn. The servants cry coming. The attendance is awkward. The barmaid too to attend us. But she is here, and will further inform me. Whither so fast, child? A word with you. Enter Miss Hardcastle. Let it be short, then. I'm in a hurry. Aside. I believe he begins to find out his mistake, but it's too soon quite to undeceive him. Pray, child, answer me one question. What are you, and what may your business in this house be? A relation of the family, sir. What, a poor relation? Yes, sir. A poor relation, appointed to keep the keys, and to see that the guests want nothing in my power to give them. That is, you act as the barmaid of this inn. Inn? Oh, law! what brought that in your head? One of the best families in the country keeping in. Ha <laughs> ha! Old Mr. Hardcastle's house and inn. Mr. Hardcastle's house? Is this Mr. Hardcastle's house, child? Aye, sure. Whose else should it be? So then, all's out, and I have been damnably imposed on. Oh, confound by my stupid head. I shall be laughed at over the whole town. I shall be stuck up in the caricature in all the print shops. The Dalissimo Macaroni, to mistake this house of all others for an inn, and my father's old friend for an innkeeper? What a swaggering puppy must he take me for? What a silly puppy do I find myself? There again, may I be hanged, my dear. But I mistook you for the barmaid. Dear me, dear me, I'm sure there's nothing in my behaviour to put me on a level with one of that stamp. Nothing, my dear, nothing. But I was in for a list of blunders and could not help making you a subscriber. My stupidity saw everything the wrong way. I mistook your assiduity for assurance, and your simplicity for allurement, but it's over. This house I no more show my face in. I hope, sir, I have done nothing to disoblige you. I am sure I should be sorry to affront any gentleman who has been so polite, and said so many civil things to me. I am sure I should be sorry. Pretending to cry. If he left the family upon my account, I'm sure I should be sorry if people said anything amiss, since I have no fortune but my character. Aside. By heaven, she weeps. This is the first mark of tenderness I ever had from a modest woman, and it touches me. To her. Excuse me, my lovely girl. You are the only part of the family I leave with reluctance. But to be plain with you, the difference of our birth, fortune, and education make an honourable connection impossible and i can never harbour a thought of seducing simplicity that trusted in my honour of bringing ruin upon one whose only fault was being too lovely aside generous man i now begin to admire him to him but i am sure my family is as good as miss ardcastle's and though i am poor that's no great misfortune to a contented mind and until this moment I never thought that it was bad to want fortune. And why now, my pretty simplicity? Because it puts me at a distance from one that, if I had a thousand pounds, I would give it all to. Aside. This simplicity bewitches me, so that if I stay, I am undone. I must make one bold effort and leave her. To her. Your partiality in my favour, my dear, touches me most sensibly. And were I to live for myself alone, I could easily fix my choice. But I owe it too much to the opinion of the world, too much to the authority of a father, so that I can scarcely speak it. It affects me. Farewell. Exit. I never knew half his merit till now. He shall not go, if I have power or art to detain him. I'll still preserve the character in which I stooped to conquer, but will undeceive my papa, 
who perhaps may laugh him out of his resolution. Exit. Enter Tony and Miss Neville. Hi, you may steal for yourselves the next time. I have done my duty. She has got the jewels again, that's a sure thing. But she believes it was all a mistake of the servants. But, my dear cousin, sure you won't forsake us in this distress. If she in the least suspects that I'm going off, I shall certainly be locked up or sent to my aunt's pedigrees, which is ten times worse. To be sure, aunts of all kinds are damned bad things. But what can I do? I have got you a pair of horses that will fly like whistle jacket, and I'm sure you can't say but I have courted you nicely before her face. Here she comes. We must court a bit or two more, for fear she would suspect us. They retire and seem to fondle. Enter Mrs. Hardcastle. Well, I was greatly fluttered, to be sure. But my son tells me it was all a mistake of the servants. I shan't be easy, however, till they are fairly married, and then let her keep her own fortune. But what do I see, fondling together as I'm alive? I never saw Tony so sprightly before. Ah, have I caught you, my pretty doves? What? Billing, exchanging stolen glances and broken murmurs. Ah. As for murmurs, mother, we grumble a little now and then, to be sure. But there's no love lost between us. A mere sprinkling, Tony, upon the flame, only to make it burn brighter. Cousin Tony promises to give us more of his company at home. Indeed, he shan't be leaving us any more. It won't leave us, Cousin Tony, will it? Oh, it's a pretty creature. No, I'd sooner leave my horse in a pound than leave you when you smile upon one so. Your laugh makes you so becoming. Agreeable cousin. Who can help but admiring and the natural humour, that pleasant, broad, red, thoughtless... Patting his cheek. Ah, it's a bold face. Pretty innocence. I'm sure I always loved Cousin Con's hazel eyes and her pretty long fingers that she twists this way and that over the haspicoles like a parcel of bobbins. Ah, he would charm the bird from the tree. I was never so happy before. My boy takes after his father, poor Mr. Lumpkin, exactly. The jewels, my dear Con, shall be yours incontinently. You shall have them. Isn't he a sweet boy, my dear? You shall be married to-morrow, and will put off the rest of his education, like Dr. Drowsy's sermons, to a fitter opportunity. Enter Diggory. Where's the squire? Uh, I've got a letter for your worship. Give it to my mamma. She reads all my letters first. I had orders to deliver it into your own hands. Who does it come from? Your worship mun ask that of the letter itself. I could wish to know, though turning the letter and gazing on it. Aside. Undone! Undone! A letter to him from Hastings. I know the hand. If my aunt sees it, we are ruined for ever. I'll keep her employed a little if I can. To Mrs. Hardcastle. But I have not told you, madam, of my cousin's smart answer just now to Mr. Marlow. We so laughed. You know, madam, this way a little, for he must not hear us. They confer. Still gazing. A damned cramped piece of penmanship as ever I saw in my life. I can read your print hand very well. But here are such handles and shanks and dashes that one can scarce tell the head from the tail. To Anthony Lumpkin, Esquire. That's very odd. I can read the outside of my letters where my own name is well enough. But when I come to open it, it's all buzz. That's hard, very hard. For the inside of the letter is always the cream of the correspondence. <laughs> very well, very well. And so my son was too hard for the philosopher. Yes, madam, and you must hear the rest, madam. A little more this way, or he may hear us. You'll hear how he puzzled him again. He seems strangely puzzled now himself, methinks. Still gazing. A damned up and down hand as if it was disguised in liquor. Reading. Dear sir. Aye, that's that. And then there's an M, and a T, and an S. 
but whether the next be an izzard or an r confound me i cannot tell what's that my dear can i give you any assistance pray aunt let me read it nobody reads a cramped hand better than i twitching the letter from him do you know who it's from can't tell except from dick ginger the feeder ay so it is pretending to read dear squire hoping you're in health as i am at this present the gentleman of the shake bad club has cut the gentleman of the goose green quite out of feather with the odds mm, odd battle um long fighting um here here it's about cocks and fighting it's of no consequence here put it up put it up thrusting the crumpled letter upon him but i tell you miss it's of all the consequence in the world i would not lose the rest of it for a guinea here mother do you make it out of no consequence giving mrs hardcastle the letter how's this reads the esquire i'm now waiting for miss neville with a post chaise and pair at the bottom of the garden but i find my horses yet unable to perform the journey i expect you'll assist us with a pair of fresh horses as you promised dispatch is necessary as the hag ay the hag your mother will otherwise suspect us yours hastings grant me patience i shall run distracted my rage chokes me i hope madam you'll suspend your resentment a few moments and not impute me to any impertinence or sinister design that belongs to another curtsying very low fine spoken madam you are most miraculously polite and engaging and quite the very pink of courtesy and circumspection madam and you you great ill-fashioned oaf with scarce sense enough to keep your mouth shut why you too joined against me but i'll defeat all your plots in a moment as for you madam since you have got a pair of fresh horses ready it would be cruel to disappoint them so if you please instead of running away with your spark prepare this very moment to run off with me your old aunt pedigree will keep you secure i'll warrant me you too sir may mount your horse and guard us upon the way here thomas roger diggory i'll show you that i wish you better than you do yourselves exit so now i'm completely ruined ay that's a sure thing what better could be expected from being connected to such a stupid fool and after all the nods and signs I made him. By the laws, miss, it was your own cleverness and not my stupidity that did your business. You were so nice and so busy with your shake bugs and goose greens that I thought you could never be making believe. Enter Hastings. So, sir, I find by my servant that you have shown my letter and betrayed us. Was this well done, young gentleman? Here's another. Ask miss there who betrayed you. Ecod, it was her doing, not mine. Enter Marlowe. So I have been finely used here among you, rendered contemptible, driven into ill manners, despised, insulted, laughed at. Here's another. We shall have old Bedlam broke loose presently. And there, sir, is the gentleman whom we all owe every obligation. What can I say to him, a mere boy, an idiot, whose ignorance and age are a protection? A poor contemptible booby, that would but disgrace correction yet with cunning and malice enough to make himself merry with all our embarrassments an insensible cub replete with tricks and mischief bah damn me but i'll fight you both one after the other with baskets as for him he's below resentment but your conduct mr hastings requires an explanation you knew of my mistakes yet would not undeceive me tortured as i am with my own disappointments is this a time for explanations it is not friendly, Mr. Marlowe. But, sir... Mr. Marlowe, we never kept on your mistake till it was too late to undeceive you. Enter servant. My mistress desires you'll get ready immediately, madam. The horses are putting to. Your hat and things are in the next room. We are to go thirty miles before morning. Exit servant. Well, well, I'll come presently. To Hastings. Was it well done, sir? 
to assist in rendering me ridiculous to hang me out for the scorn of all my acquaintance depend upon it sir i shall expect an explanation was it well done sir if you're upon that subject to deliver what i entrusted to yourself to the care of another sir mr hastings mr marlow why will you increase my distress with this groundless dispute i implore you i entreat you enter servant your cloak madam my mistress is impatient exit servant i come pray be pacified if i leave you thus i shall die with apprehension enter servant your fan muff and gloves madam the horses are waiting oh mr marlow if you knew what a scene of constraint and ill nature lies before me i'm sure you would convert your resentments into pity i am so distracted with the variety of passions that i don't know what to do forgive me madam george forgive me you know my hasty temper and should not exasperate it the torture of my situation is my only excuse well my dear hastings if you have that esteem for me that i think that i am sure you have your constancy for three years will but increase the happiness of our future connection if within miss neville constance why constance i say i'm coming well constancy remember constancy is the word exit my heart how can i support this to be so near happiness and such happiness to tony you see now young gentleman the effects of your folly what might be amusement to you is here disappointment and even distress from a reverie hmm ecod i have hit it it's here your hands yours and yours my poor sulky my boots there ho oh. meet me two hours hence at the bottom of the garden and if you don't find tony lumpkin a more good-natured fellow than you thought for i'll give you leave to take my best horse and bet bouncer into the bargain come along my boots ho oh. exeunt end of act four Act Five of She Stoops to Conquer. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. She Stoops to Conquer by Oliver Goldsmith. Act the Fifth. Scene continued. Enter Hastings and servant. You saw the old lady and Miss Neville drive off. You say? Yes, Your Honour. They went off in a post coach, and the young squire went on horseback. They're thirty miles off by this time. Then all my hopes are over. Yes, sir. Old Sir Charles has arrived. He and the old gentleman of the house have been laughing at Mr. Marlowe's mistake this half hour. They are coming this way. Then I must not be seen. So now to my fruitless appointment at the bottom of the garden. This is about the time. Exit. Enter Sir Charles and Hardcastle. Ha 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 ha! The peremptory tone in which he sent forth his sublime commands and the reserve which i suppose he treated all your advances and yet he might have seen something in me above a common innkeeper too yes dick but he mistook you for an uncommon innkeeper <laughs> well i'm in too good spirits to think of anything but joy yes my dear friend this union of our families will make our personal friendships hereditary and though my daughter's fortune is but small why dick will you talk of fortune to me my son is possessed of more than a competence already and can want nothing but a good and virtuous girl to share his happiness and increase it if they like each other as you say they do if man i tell you they do like each other my daughter as good as told me so but girls are apt to flatter themselves you know i saw him grasp her hand in the warmest manner myself and here he comes to put you out of your ifs i warrant him enter marlow i come sir once more to ask pardon for my strange conduct i can scarce reflect on my insolence without confusion that boy a trifle you take it too gravely an hour or two's laughing with my daughter will set all to rights again she'll never like you the worse for it sir i shall be always proud of her approbation 
Approbation is a cold word, Mr. Marlowe. If I'm not deceived, you have something more than approbation thereabouts. You take me. Really, sir, I have not that happiness. Come, boy, I am an old fellow, and know what's what as well as you that are younger. I know what has passed between you, but, mum. Sure, sir, nothing has passed between us but the most profound respect on my side, and the most distant reserve on us. You don't think, sir, that my impudence has been passed upon all the rest of the family. Impudence? No, I don't say that. Not quite impudence, though girls like to be played with, and rumpled a little, too, sometimes. But she has told no tales, I assure you. I never gave her a slightest cause. Well, well, I like modesty in its place well enough. But this is overacting, young gentleman. You may be open. Your father and I will like you all the better for it. May I die, sir? if i ever i tell you she don't dislike you and as i'm sure you like her dear sir i protest sir i see no reason why you should not be joined as fast as the parson can tie you but hear me sir your father approves the match i admire it every moment's delay will be doing mischief so but why won't you hear me by all that's just and true i never gave miss hardcastle the slightest mark of my attachment or even the most distant hint to suspect me of affection we had but one interview and that was formal modest and uninteresting aside this fellow's formal modest impudence is beyond bearing and you never grasped her hand or made any protestations as heaven is my witness i came down in obedience to your commands i saw the lady without emotion and parted without reluctance i hope you will exact no farther proofs of my duty nor prevent me from leaving a house in which i suffer so many mortifications exit i'm astonished at the air of sincerity with which he parted and i'm astonished at the deliberate intrepidity of his assurance i dare pledge my life and honour upon his truth here comes my daughter and I would stake my happiness upon her veracity. Enter Miss Hardcastle. Kate, come hither, child. Answer us sincerely and without reserve. Has Mr. Marlowe made you any professions of love and affection? The question is very abrupt, sir. But since you require unreserved sincerity, I think he has. To Sir Charles. You see? And pray, madam, have you and my son had more than one interview? Yes, sir, several. To Sir Charles. You see? But did he profess any attachment? A lasting one. Did he talk of love? Much, sir. Amazing. And all this formally? Formally. Now, oh, my friend, I hope you are satisfied. And how did he behave, madam? As most professed admirers do, said some civil things of my face, talked much of his want of merit, and the greatness of mine, mentioned his heart, gave a short tragedy speech, and ended with pretended rapture. Now I'm perfectly convinced indeed. I know his conversation among women to be modest and submissive. This forward canting, ranting manner by no means describes him, and I am confident he never sat for the picture. Then what, sir, if I should convince you to your face of my sincerity? If you and my papa, in about half an hour, will place yourselves behind that screen, you shall hear him declare his passion to me in person. Agreed. And if I find him what you describe, all my happiness in him must have an end. Exit. And if you don't find him what I describe, I fear my happiness must never have a beginning. Exit. Scene changes to the back of the garden. Enter Hastings. What an idiot am I to wait here for a fellow who probably takes delight in mortifying me. He never intended to be punctual, and I'll wait no longer. What do I see? It is he, and perhaps with news of my Constance. Enter Tony, booted and spattered. My honest squire, I now find you a man of your word. This looks like friendship. Aye, I'm your friend and the best friend you have in the world, if you knew but all. This riding by night, by the by, is cursedly tiresome. It has shook me worse than the basket of a stagecoach. But how? Where did you leave your fellow travellers? Are they in safety? Are they housed? 
Five and twenty miles in two hours and a half is not such bad driving. The poor beasts have smoked for it. Rabbit me, but I'd rather ride forty miles after a fox than ten with such a varmint. Well, but where have you left the ladies? I die with impatience. Left them? Why, where should I leave them but where I found them? This is a riddle. Riddle me this, then. What goes round the house, and round the house, and never touches the house? I'm still astray. Why, that's it, Mon. I have led them astray. By jingo, there's not a pond or a slow within five miles of the place, but they can tell the taste of. <laughs> I understand. You took them in a round while they supposed themselves going forward, and so you have at last brought them home again. You shall hear. I first took them down Featherbed Lane, where we stuck fast in the mud. I then rattled them crack over the stones of up and down hill. I then introduced them to the gibbet on Heavy Tree Heath, and from that, with a circumbendibus, I have fairly lodged them in a horse pond at the bottom of the garden. But no accident, I hope. Oh, no! Only Mother is confoundedly frightened. She thinks herself forty miles off. She's sick of the journey, and the cattle can scarce crawl. So, if your own horses be ready, you may whip off with Cousin, and I'll be bound that no soul here can budge a foot to follow you. My dear friend, how can I be grateful? Aye, now it's dear friend, noble squire. Just now it was all idiot cub and run me through the guts. Damn your way of fighting, I say. After we take a knock in this part of the country, we kiss and me friends. But if you had run me through the guts, then I should be dead, and you might go kiss the hangman. The rebuke is just, but I must hasten to relieve Miss Neville. If you keep the old lady employed, I promise to take care of the young one. Exit Hastings. Never fear me. Here she comes, vanish. She's got from the pond, and draggled up to the waist like a mermaid. Enter Mrs. Hardcastle. Oh, Tony, I'm killed, shook, battered to death. I shall never survive it. That last jolt that laid us against a quickset hedge has done my business. Alack, Mama, it was all your own fault. You would be for running away by night, without knowing one inch of the way. I wish we were at home again. I never met so many accidents in so short a journey. Drenched in the mud, overturned in a ditch, stuck fast in a slough, jolted to a jelly, and at last to lose our way. Whereabouts do you think we are, Tony? By my guess we should have come upon Crackskull Common, about forty miles from home. Oh, Lud, oh, Lud, the most notorious spot in all the country. We only want a robbery to make a complete night on't. Don't be afraid, Mama, don't be afraid. Two of the five that kept here are hanged, and the other three may not find us. Don't be afraid. Is that a man that's galloping behind us? Uh, no, no, it's, it's only a tree. Don't be afraid. The fright will certainly kill me. Do you see anything like a black hat moving behind the thicket? Oh, death! No, it, it's only a cow. Don't be afraid, Mama, don't be afraid. As I'm alive, Tony, I see a man coming towards us. Ah, oh, I'm sure, Aunt. If he perceives us, we are undone. Aside. Father-in-law, by all that's unlucky, come to take one of his night walks. To her. Ah, it's a highwayman with pistols as long as my arm. A damned ill-looking fellow. Good heaven defend us. He approaches. Do you hide yourself in that thicket and leave me to manage him? If there be any danger, I'll cough and cry, ahem. <clears throat> when I cough, be sure to keep close. Mrs. Hardcastle hides behind a tree in the back scene. Enter Hardcastle. I'm mistaken, or I heard voices of people in want of help. Oh, Tony, is that you? I did not expect you so soon back. Are your mother and her charge in safety? Very safe, sir, at my Aunt Pedigree's. Ahem. <clears throat> From behind. Ah, oh, death, I find there's danger. Forty miles in three hours? Sure that's too much, my youngster. Stout horses and willing minds make short journeys, as they say. <clears throat> From behind. Sure he'll do the dear boy no harm. But I heard a voice here. I should be glad to know from whence it came. It was I, sir, talking to myself, sir. I was saying that forty miles in four hours was very good going. 
as to be sure it was. <coughs> I have got a sort of cold by being out in the air. We'll go in, if you please. <coughs> but if you talk to yourself, you did not answer yourself. I'm certain I heard two voices, and am resolved to find the other out. From behind. Oh, he's coming to find me out. Oh. What need you go, sir, if I tell you? <coughs> I'll lay down my life for the truth. <coughs> I'll tell you all, sir. Detaining him. I tell you I will not be detained. I insist on seeing. It's in vain to expect I'll believe you. Oh, lad, he'll murder my poor boy, my darling. Running forward from behind. Here, good gentlemen, wet your rage upon me. Take my money, my life, but spare that young gentleman. Spare my child, if you have any mercy. My wife, as I am a Christian. From whence can she come? Oh, what does she mean? Take compassion on us, good Mr. Highwayman. Kneeling. Take our money, our watches, all we have, but spare our lives. We will never bring you to justice. Indeed we won't, good Mr. Highwayman. I believe the woman's out of her senses. What, Dorothy, don't you know me? Mr. Hartcastle, as I'm alive. My fears blinded me. But who, my dear, could have expected to meet you here, in this frightful place so far from home? What has brought you to follow us? Surely, Dorothy, you have not lost your wits, so far from a home, when you are within the forty yards of your own door. To him. This is one of your old tricks, you graceless rogue, you. To her. Don't you know the gates and the mulberry tree? And don't you remember the horse-pond, my dear? Yes, I shall remember the horse-pond as long as I live. I have caught my death in it. To Tony. And it is to you, you graceless varlet, I owe all this. I'll teach you to abuse your mother, I will. Ecod, mother, all the parish says you have spoiled me, and so you may take the fruits on't. I'll spoil you, I will. Follows him off the stage. Exit. There's morality, however, in his reply. Exit. Enter Hastings and Miss Neville. My dear Constance, why will you deliberate thus? If we delay a moment, all is lost for ever. Pluck up a little resolution, and we shall soon be out of reach of her malignity. I find it impossible. My spirits are so sunk in the agitations I have suffered that I am unable to face any new danger. Two or three years of patience will at last crown us with happiness. Such a tedious delay is worse than inconstancy. Let us fly, my charmer. Let us date our happiness from this very moment. Perish fortune. Love and content will increase what we possess beyond a monarch's revenue. Let me prevail. No, Mr. Hastings, no. Prudence once more comes to my relief, and I will obey its dictates. In the moment of passion, fortune may be despised but it ever produces a lasting repentance. I am resolved to apply to Mr. Hardcastle's compassion and justice for Redress. But though he had the will, he has not the power to relieve you. But he has influence, and upon that I am resolved to rely. I have no hopes, but since you persist, I must reluctantly obey you. Exeunt. Scene changes. Enter Sir Charles and Miss Hardcastle. What a situation I am in! If what you say appears, I shall then find a guilty son. If what he says to be true, then I shall lose one that, of all others, I most wished for a daughter. I am proud of your approbation, and to show I merit it, if you place yourselves as I directed, you shall hear his explicit declaration. But he comes. I'll to your father, and keep him to the appointment. Exit Sir Charles. Enter Marlowe. Though prepared for setting out, I come once more to take leave. Nor did I, till this moment, know the pain I feel in the separation. In her own natural manner. I believe sufferings cannot be very great, sir, which you can so easily remove. A day or two longer, perhaps, might lessen your uneasiness, by showing the little value of what you now think proper to regret. Aside. This girl every moment improves upon me. To her. 
it must not be madam i have already trifled too long with my heart my very pride begins to submit to my passion the disparity of education and fortune the anger of a parent and the contempt of my equals begin to lose their weight and nothing can restore me to myself but this painful effort of resolution then go sir i'll urge nothing more to detain you though my family be as good as hers you came down to visit and my education i hope not inferior what are these advantages without equal affluence i must remain contented with the slight approbation of imputed merit i must have only the mockery of your addresses while all your serious aims are fixed on fortune enter hardcastle and sir charles from behind here behind this screen ay ay make no noise i'll engage my case covers him with confusion at last by heavens madam fortune was ever my smallest consideration your beauty at first caught my eye for who could see that without emotion but every moment that i converse with you steals in some new grace heightens the picture and gives it a stronger expression what at first seemed rustic plainness now appears refined simplicity what seemed forward assurance now strikes me as the result of courageous innocence and conscious virtue what can it mean he amazes me i told you how it would be hush i am now determined to stay madam and i have too good an opinion of my father's discernment when he sees you to doubt his approbation no mr marlowe i will not cannot detain you do you think i could suffer a connection in which there is the smallest room for repentance do you think i would take the mean advantage of a transient passion to load you with confusion do you think i could ever relish that happiness which was acquired by lessening yours by all that's good i can have no happiness but what's in your power to grant me nor shall i ever feel repentance but in not having seen your merits before i will stay even contrary to your wishes and though you should persist to shun me i will make my respectful assiduities atone for the levity of my past conduct sir i must entreat you'll desist as our acquaintance began so let it end in indifference i might have given an hour or two to levity but seriously mr marlowe do you think i could ever submit to a connection where i must appear mercenary and you imprudent do you think i could ever catch at the confident addresses of a secure admirer does this look like security kneeling does this look like confidence no madam every moment that shows me your merit only serves to increase my diffidence and confusion here let me continue i can hold it no longer charles charles how hast thou deceived me is this your indifference your uninteresting conversation your cold contempt your formal interview what have you to say now that i am all amazement what can it mean it means that you can say and unsay things at pleasure that you can address a lady in private and deny it in public that you have one story for us and another for my daughter daughter this lady your daughter yes sir my only daughter my kate whose else should she be oh the devil yes sir that very identical tall squinting lady you were pleased to take me for curtsying she that you addressed as the mild modest sentimental man of gravity and the bold forward agreeable rattle of the ladies club <laughs> zounds there is no bearing this it's worse than death in which of your characters sir will you give us leave to address you as the faltering gentleman with looks on the ground that speaks just to be heard and hates hypocrisy or the loud confident creature that keeps it up with mrs mantrap and old miss biddy buckskin till three in the morning <laughs> oh curse on my noisy head i never attempted to be impudent yet that i was not taken down i must be gone by the hand of my body but you shall not i see it was all a mistake and i am rejoiced to find it you shall not sir i tell you i know she'll forgive you won't you forgive him kate we'll all forgive you take courage man they retire she tormenting him to the back scene enter mrs hardcastle and tony so so they are gone off let them go i care not who gone 
my dutiful niece and her gentleman mr hastings from town he who came down with our modest visitor here who my honest george hastings as worthy a fellow as lives and the girl could not have made a more prudent choice then by the hand of my body i'm proud of the connection well if he has taken away the lady he has not taken her fortune that remains in this family to console us for her loss sure dorothy you would not be so mercenary ay that's my affair not yours but you know if your son when of age refuses to marry his cousin her whole fortune is then at her own disposal ay but he's not of age and she has not thought proper to wait for his refusal enter hastings and miss neville aside what return so soon i begin not to like it to hardcastle for my late attempt to fly off with your niece let my present confusion be my punishment we are now come back to appeal from your justice to your humanity by her father's consent I first paid her my addresses, and our passions were first founded in duty. Since his death, I have been obliged to stoop to dissimulation to avoid oppression. In an hour of levity, I am ready to give up my fortune to secure my choice. But I am now recovered from the delusion, and I hope your tenderness what is denied to me from a nearer connection. Psha, psha, this is all but the whining end of a modern novel. Be it what it will. I'm glad they're come back to reclaim their due. Come hither, Tony, boy. Do you refuse this lady's hand whom I now offer you? What signifies my refusing? You know I can't refuse her till I'm of age, father. While I thought concealing your age, boy, was likely to conduce to your improvement, I concurred with your mother's desire to keep it secret. But since I find she turns it to a wrong use— I must now declare you have been of age these three months. Of age? Am I of age, father? Above three months. Then you'll see the first use I'll make of my liberty. Taking Miss Neville's hand. Witness all men by these presents that I, Anthony Lumpkin, Esquire, of blank place, refuse you, Constantia Neville, spinster of no place at all, for my true and lawful wife. So, Constance Neville may marry whom she pleases, and Tony Lumpkin is his own man again. Oh, brave squire, my worthy friend. My undutiful offspring. Joy, my dear George, I give you joy sincerely, and could I prevail upon my little tyrant here to be less arbitrary, I should be the happiest man alive, if you would return me the favour. To Miss Hardcastle. Come, madame, you are now driven to the very last scene of all your contrivances. I know you like him. I'm sure he loves you, and you must and shall have him. And I say so, too. Joining their hands. And, Mr. Marlowe, if she makes as good a wife as she has a daughter, I don't believe you'll ever repent your bargain. So, now to supper. Tomorrow we shall gather all the poor of the parish about us, and the mistakes of the night shall be crowned with a merry morning. So, boy, take her, and as you have been mistaken in the mistress, my wish is that you may never be mistaken in the wife. Exeunt Omnis End of Act Five This concludes She Stoops to Conquer, or The Mistakes of a Knight, by Oliver Goldsmith.